My beloved people, I want to thank you, first of all, for coming today in order to take part in this mini Lenten retreat, this day of recollection. But in order to benefit by this spiritual exercise today, we must, in fact, strive to do those two things, retreat and recollect ourselves. We must retreat from the world and its illusions and false values. We must retreat from all the worries and problems of our everyday life. Those things which, most of the time, totally preoccupies all our attention and mental energy. Let all those things just drop away today. And try not to let anything disturb your peace of soul. Anything like anxiety and worry will hinder reaping much spiritual fruit from this day of recollection. And if we have retreated away from the world, it is in order to retreat into the presence of God, the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is present body, blood, soul, and divinity in the blessed sacrament here before you. It is he alone who can truly give rest and peace to your weary heart. You have come to listen to Christ speaking within you. He speaks not so much with distinct words, but by infusing into your soul greater light and courage and strength and hope to carry on carrying your daily cross. Our Lord said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And our Lord cried out, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Remember that a retreat or a day of recollection is not really a community exercise. Not something that we do with other people. Because you are in a group, there is a danger that each of you individually might try to lose yourselves in the crowd. To go through the motions with everyone else, but not to make any progress personally. Understand that our Lord is not looking at you as a group but he has his entire attention on each one of you as though you were the only one in this church. In fact, the only person in the entire world. You are alone with God alone. And therefore today, in fact, every day of our life, we must strive to place ourselves squarely in the path of our Lord. He's coming this way. We're going to go straight on and face him. And we have to decide how we are going to interact with Christ. Accept him or reject him. Father Edward Lean, speaking about a retreat, he said, making a retreat is literally this. It is the deliberate placing of myself in the path of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with a view of grasping what his view of my life and conduct, accompanied by a resolve to shape that life and that conduct in accordance with his decision, judging to be wrong what he judges to be wrong, judging that I should become what he says I should become, and henceforth arranging my life in accordance with the light I have received. It is a thing of dreadful irresponsibility to place oneself squarely in the presence of Jesus Christ, Because in presence of him, you are in presence of reality. And that reality has an utterly shattering effect. It is merciless and relentless in face of the vast growth of unreality in our souls. How much of what we do and what we say is unreal and untrue. Unquote. So today... In fact, every day we must accept our Lord's invitation and inspiration to grow in union with him and friendship with him. No more running from Christ. He is the hound of heaven. And he's been chasing you. And you know he has. I bet if I were to ask each one of you, and if you were honest in your heart, it's like our Lord was hunting you. And we keep running away. We don't want to surrender. 
In the words of the Catholic poet Francis Thompson, he said, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the Lambert time ways. So no more running. Let him finally catch you. Surrender to him. It's really the only way to have peace and to be free. Since we are in the season of Lent, and since Lent's culmination is Holy Week, and since the heart of Holy Week is the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is therefore fitting on this Lenten Day of Recollection to focus on the passion of our divine Savior. And let us look at his cross and how his cross fits into our lives. Since we do not have much time, I can only briefly sum up the whole mystery of the redemption. First, we know about original sin. Adam fell, and his fall introduced physical suffering and death into the world. But even more, he sinned mortally and died the death, a spiritual death by losing the precious gift of sanctifying grace, which is none other but a participation in the divine nature, divine life, the very life of God in his soul. He wanted to be like God, but he already was. He didn't want the holiness of God. He wanted the independence of God. And since Adam was the head of the human race, all humanity was defiled in the source. From its source, the well was poisoned. And since then, mankind has added his own countless sins. And for all these sins, as we know, God would demand satisfaction. He didn't have to, but he did. He demanded infinite satisfaction, perfect satisfaction, because he, the offended one, is infinite. And we judge an offense by the one who is offended. We judge the value of it. Since God is infinite... The offense was infinite. And the problem was that mere man could never give infinite satisfaction. We're finite creatures. But in God's infinite mercy and goodness, he found a solution. The second person of the most blessed trinity would himself become man by assuming to himself a complete human nature, a body and a soul. in addition to his divine nature. And by this means, he would become the second Adam, the new head of a redeemed humanity, of a new race of men, spiritually reborn, if they so chose. It was up to them if they wanted it. But he would redeem us as we know, by nothing else than his own death on the cross. And because he was truly man, his expiation would be in man's name, truly in man's name. It was man that gave satisfaction. But because he was an infinite divine person, his sacrifice and his sufferings and his death carried with them an infinite value of satisfaction for sin. And God's infinite justice was perfectly satisfied opening to us the possibility of entering heaven and enjoying the beatific vision for all eternity. And he did this by purchasing for us the precious gift of sanctifying grace, which is really life everlasting, begun here on earth, to be completed and perfected in heaven. In meditating on the passion of Christ, we should always keep in mind the intensity of his sufferings both of soul and body, in order to have a just appreciation of them. And this helps us see the cost of sin. It also demonstrates most clearly how much our Lord loves us. O all ye that pass by the way, attend and see if there be any sorrow like to my sorrow. And rightly we can place, place those words of the prophet Jeremiah on the lips of our crucified Savior. He is the man of sorrows. St. Thomas Aquinas said this, quote, 
The pain suffered by our Lord was the greatest pain possible in this life. Unquote. And the Dominican theologian Father Walter Farrell writes this, quote, Christ allowed his human nature to experience the length and the breadth and the depth of human suffering. Because he suffered to atone for the sins of all men, he allowed himself to endure the fullness of human pain. Unquote. And Father Edward Lean explains this further. He says, The sufferings of Christ, intense in themselves, were inconceivably bitter because of the extreme sensitiveness of him who suffered. The exquisite sensibility of a sacred body added a peculiar intensity to the sufferings of the Savior. The finest and most delicately balanced nature that we could imagine would be blunt of perception compared with the Christ. His body was fashioned by the hands of the Holy Spirit himself to be the matter of the supreme sacrifice. It can be said that the body of Christ was made for suffering because expressly fashioned for sacrifice. Sacrifice and oblation thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast fitted to me. Holocaust for sin did not please thee. Then said I, behold, I come. When one thinks of the thoroughness of the divine workmanship, awful in the extreme, must have been the agonies experienced by him who was fashioned by God for the endurance of pain. Unquote. Something that we don't usually keep in mind. Our Savior suffered in every part of his body, in his head by the crown of thorns, in his hands and feet by the nails, in his face by the buffets and the slaps and the blinding spittle. And his body was covered in wounds. He was beaten horribly by the cruel scourges. And all this was what led St. Alphonsus to write this. He truly suffered for us more than all the penitents, all the anchorites, all the martyrs have suffered, because God laid upon him the weight of rigorous satisfaction to the divine justice for all the sins of men. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. When we read the lives of the martyrs, it seems at first as if some of them had suffered pains more bitter than those of Jesus Christ. Upon which St. Lawrence Justinian writes that in each of the torments which our Lord endured, on account of the agony and the intensity of the suffering, he suffered as much as all the tortures of martyrs. So my dear people, he who knew so much suffering, the maximum of human pain, cannot but be most understanding and compassionate towards us in our own suffering. He knew your suffering from personal experience. So we can't say to our Lord, he doesn't understand. But what about, what was it? What, what about his death that was pleasing to God? Was it the blood? Was it the suffering in themselves? No, it wasn't. It was because his death was a true sacrifice. And this is important. What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice for God is like a sacred drama, a play, a sign portraying externally and in the most eloquent and impressive manner man's complete and loving inward submission to and willing dependence upon God. The passion was the true and perfect liturgical sacrifice of which all the sacrifices of the old law were but shadows. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial lamb or or other animal was destroyed, was sacrificed, was given completely back to God. That is what sacrifice means. Sacrum fatre, to make sacred. It was made sacred and separate and consecrated as a sign of the priest's and the people's inward submission to God, and as a testimony of their allegiance to God. But from all eternity, God had decreed as the price of man's salvation that Christ, as the head and representative of humanity, 
would freely surrender his life in token as of humanity's willing obedience unto death. Willing obedience to God. So the whole passion from the Garden of Gethsemane to the Hill of Calvary was an act of obedience. That's what pleased God. And his whole life could be summed up in the words of St. Paul. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. And in this great sacrifice, Christ was both priest and victim. The offerer and the offered. And as victim, he would be completely passive. He would be powerless in their hands. But only apparently, only because he willed it. He said, Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No man taketh it away from me, but I lay it down of myself, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And as priest elevated on the cross, he offered his wounds, his blood, his agony, and his death to his Father as eloquent testimony of his obedience to the divine will, even unto death. Man was at last completely obedient to God. He was as he ought to be. He was put in his place. And it was the greatest act of adoration and love this world has ever seen, or will ever see. And it had infinite value. But the putting to death of Christ was the greatest crime that has ever stained human hands, and thus could not of itself be agreeable to God. It would be wrong to think that God found some sort of satisfaction in the sufferings of his only begotten Son in themselves. In themselves, his sufferings were abhorrent to God. But all this dreadful suffering was completely transformed into a thing of radiant beauty because it was the outward expression, not of just heroic endurance, but of heroic love and, and obedience, a proof of an utterly selfless love. God does not love suffering in itself. And Christ did not seek suffering for its own sake. He merely endured it. So in this sense, he did not choose the cross, but rather he bore it willingly, patiently. It was God the Father who chose the cross as the means of man's salvation. Our blessed Savior freely accepted this decision. And he abandoned himself completely to his Father's will down to the last detail. It doesn't matter what it costs me, I will do God's will. So it was the great love that was behind this sacrifice that was pleasing to God. He said, our Lord said, that the world may know that I love the Father. So it was a sign. And the Pharisees called him a fool, and they were right, he was. He was a fool of love. Love drove him to such utter folly for us. The mystery of the passion and death of Jesus Christ is at the heart of our faith. It is that center and core of Catholicism. And this is why the sign of the cross is woven into everything we do. And not only does the church desire that we often trace upon ourselves the sign of our redemption, it also encourages us to never have the image of the crucified or the crucifix far from our sight. And by the way, we should look at the crucifix more often. We take it for granted. We have it almost in every room, but we hardly look at it anymore. Even just a glance would be a prayer. Yet it's not enough to seek the cross physically. And the soldiers, after they had finished nailing the Son of God to the cross, sat and watched him die. They saw every detail of the sufferings of Christ, but that's all they saw. To them it was merely another execution. They had eyes, but they did not see. And so it is with many of us, perhaps. 
We see the crucifix very often. We read books describing the passion. We even watch that excellent movie, The Passion of the Christ, which I personally believe to be a providential sign that we are probably in the end times. A last chance, as it were, announcing the passion to the world before he returns. And we see all these things. And although we may not be entirely indifferent or dead to it, it doesn't stir us as deeply as it should. And if it doesn't stir us, how do we expect the world to be stirred by it? And we usually stop at the surface of it all, the physical side of his sufferings. And that's good to a certain degree, but we have to go deeper. Many of us can picture in detail the awful scenes of Christ's bloody passion within our imagination, and tears may even well up in our eyes. But how many penetrate past the externals and understand the profound inner meaning of these mysteries? I think, unfortunately, most Catholics, and I wasn't the first to say say this, Father Edward Lean wrote this too, says most Catholics pass all their days on earth reaching their graves and stumbling into eternity, stumbling into eternity, without ever having a clear, full, and Catholic grasp of this central mystery of their religion. And the practical and spiritual implications of the cross for everyday life are rarely grasped and consequently rarely have a practical impact on our lives. One way well asked, does the average Catholic truly understand the cross? And probably the answer is no. Now we know that <clears throat> out of an overwhelming love for us, God surrendered to death his only begotten son, to the awful and horrible death of the cross. And by the cross we are saved. What does that statement mean? By the cross we are saved. <clears throat> Briefly, There are two interpretations of the cross, and they differ as night and day. The first is the typical non-Catholic view. Christ suffered for me, and in my place, he has done it all. I believe. I accept him as my Savior. My part is finished. Now, for the Catholic, the passion of Christ entails much more than that. We are much more involved than that. All Catholics believe that our redemption is through Christ alone, through his sacrifice on the cross, and that the Eternal Father accepted the satisfaction, and as far as God is concerned, our redemption was complete. But it still remains for us to do our part so that our own soul truly benefits by Christ's work. And we are not saved merely by the fact of Christ's death. Or every single person would be saved in the world. Everyone would be a great saint if that's all that was needed. Just the mere fact of Christ's death. The grace obtained by Christ is sufficient to save a million worlds. Then why aren't there all, everyone a saint? Because between Calvary and our own personal salvation and sanctification, something of the utmost Importance intervenes, our free will. As St. Augustine said, God created us without our cooperation, but he will not redeem us without our cooperation. In order for the grace of Calvary to be applied to our souls as individuals, we must actively unite ourselves with Christ. First of all, by baptism and the sacraments, by faith and hope and charity, We must obey God's commandments and freely cooperate with God's grace. And we must, through the carrying of our own cross, our daily cross, in union with our Lord's, we have to enter into the passion of our Lord to benefit by it. The Catholic view of the cross is this. The cross does not end with Christ. The cross is really Christ's theory of life, his philosophy of life, his way of life, his way to heaven. And unless we understand it in that way, our devotion to the passion of Christ is not as it should be. It is really the symbol of the Christian way of living. It teaches us 
that sacrifice is the essential condition for attaining the salvation which Christ won for us. There is no salvation that doesn't cost us anything. Sacrifice is not only for the Savior, but for the saved as well. The cross is not only for Christ, but for every Christian. The cross of the divine master does not dispense us from carrying our own cross in his footsteps. But it is his cross and his sufferings that sanctify our individual sufferings and crosses. Because without his sufferings, our sufferings would be absolutely worthless. But in union with his sacrifice, our cross receives its value and it makes our good actions, our sufferings, and our good works meritorious and worthy of an eternal reward. And that is how we participate in varying degrees in the infinite merits of our, that our Lord won for us. That is how we enter into the joy of our Master by sharing his cross. To imitate Christ, to imitate Christ, to be united with our crucified Lord, it's not enough. We are not asked to merely, we are not asked to seek suffering and pain in themselves. We are called to sacrifice, called to carry that cross, which being a Christian entails. And it is a cross. It's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to be a Catholic. It's hard to follow the commandments. That's the cross. That's the essential cross. And we are called to shoulder that the daily pain in keeping faithful to the divine will. And it is. It's hurtful to say no to ourselves. But we have to be faithful to his commandments, his counsels. Carrying our crosses to suffer the inconvenience that is involved in doing all that God wants and in wanting all that God does to us. The cross must be implanted into our hearts. As Father Edward Lean wrote, we are not saved by looking at the cross of Christ and contemplating his sufferings and pitying them and even weeping over them, not even by acknowledging with gratitude that his blood has been shed for the expiation of our sins. We are not saved by standing outside the cross. No, we are saved only by taking it into our own hearts and setting it in our own lives as the interpretation of the whole riddle of existence and as the key to the problem of our own practical living. So this is the true understanding of the cross. The cross is the instrument of our redemption, but it has to go deep within us. Because redemption, if it means anything at all, it means a transformation, a deep change within us. Redemption and sanctification is meant to affect an interior transformation, conforming us to Christ, incorporating us into Christ, mystically identifying us with Christ. St. Paul said, with Christ, I am crucified to the world. And with Christ, I will rise again. This explains almost everything we do as Catholics. It explains why there's still suffering in the world. You would think if Christ did everything, why is there still suffering? What's the point of this suffering? And that's why we Catholics, we have the answer to the riddle of the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. To the world, it's, if God is good, why does he allow this? Because it's not over yet. The cross is not over. The cross, and why God allows Suffering in our life is because the cross is the instrument, the scalpel, as it were, in the divine surgery, which serves to mortify. Mortify literally means to put to death that unhappy life within our soul. We have a fallen life, a sinful inclination that has to die. That has to die. Anything that conflicts or hinders the life of God within our soul has to die here or after. And that is why we have suffering. And so the daily sufferings of life, if they're born in union with the cross, they bring life through death. 
They bring life through death. And our spiritual life, or the life of grace, will be in exact proportion to the death of self that is opposed to God. This is why our Lord said, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. So in other words, to reject the cross, and naturally we want to, but to reject the cross... And to reject that death of that evil life within us is really to forsake true life. The cross is meant to be embraced, not morbidly, as an instrument of torture. We're not supposed to like it. But it's supposed to be bravely and lovingly embraced, accepted as an instrument of healing. And our daily cross, if accepted with the proper Christ-like disposition, will Destroy all those obstacles in us that keep us from real happiness and peace. And our Lord had a deep insight into human nature. And he never asks us what is impossible, unreasonable, or even exceptionally difficult. It would be contrary to his goodness and his wisdom for him to do so. Fortunately for us, we we need not go looking for crosses. Everyday life swarms with abundant opportunities for little sacrifices, little acts of self-renunciation. And if we would but look, we would see them. They're all around us. And more often than not, our crosses come to us walking on two feet. So we need not construct artificial ones to die upon. Each day brings his own generous share of little crosses and occasionally big crosses too. And if the initiative were left entirely to us, we would always take the line of least resistance, which would not be good for our souls. If we waited until we felt like doing something, we would hardly do anything at all in the spiritual life. Because duty is so frequently contrary to our natural tastes. And God certainly knows this, our instinctive instinctive repugnance for sacrifice and how difficult and contrary to our nature it is for us to embrace a sacrifice willingly. And therefore, and therefore, in his goodness and mercy, he makes provision for this by sending us crosses or permitting some suffering in our life. Life is meant to be a cross. We may not like to hear that, but it's the fact. Life is meant to be a cross for the purification of our soul. And life is not meant to be a never-ending hunt for pleasure and the gratification of all our whims and desires. I was once asked by someone, how can I explain to someone why is there suffering in the world? And I said, probably the the briefest way to answer it is to say that the Catholic view of life is that life is meant to be a purification and not a gratification. But the world flips it. Life is meant to be a gratification first and not a purification. But as the Catholic philosophy. So literally, our life is meant to be a passion, patiently born. And the word passion implies passive suffering. To be acted upon by life's uncertain circumstances. Passion, notice the word passion and and patience, they come from the same root word. A passive suffering, passio. And St. Benedict in his holy rule for months had a line that always stood out for me. Every year we read it. We read read it actually six times a year. Always stood out. I said, it is by patience that we share in the sufferings of Christ. Nine tenths of sanctity is just patience. It's not so much the frantic activity, it's patience. So it's very simple. If we only welcomed and accepted with peace the crosses God arranges for us and said yes, we said yes, we would turn garbage into gold. I must wrap up this talk, but before I do, I must mention one more thing. Actually, two more points. And although I can't do it really justice in the brief time, 
please bear with me, and take to heart the following truths, because they give so much meaning to our useless sufferings. Why must we suffer? The deepest answer is that we suffer because the passion is not finished yet. The passion is not just an historical event. It is happening. Mystically, Christ is on the cross until the end of time. When we make the stations of the cross, when we meditate on the passion, we see Christ in the center and the multitude round about him, priests, soldiers, people. And we have our place in it. Am I one of the Pharisees or soldiers or just one of the crowd, a bystander? I'm merely a sympathizer, pitying Christ but staying at a distance. But as a Christian, as a Catholic, we cannot stand in the crowd. We must be where Christ is. We must suffer with Christ, taking his place and position. Listen to those mysterious words of St. Paul, words that explain so much in our life and give deep meaning to our own suffering. St. Paul writes, I rejoice now in the sufferings I bear for your sake. I fill up those things that are wanting for the sufferings of Christ, for his body, which is the church. That's the key. The purpose to our own personal sufferings and sacrifice. It is the doctrine of the mystical body. Indeed, in the order of time, Christ suffers no more. It's over. In his personal humanity, he can't suffer any more pain. It's finished. But we, his mystical body, can. And the sufferings of our head, Jesus Christ, are complete and perfect. Our Lord, now glorified in heaven, has suffered more than enough. But his mystical body still needs to finish its part of the passion. We are intimately associated in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We are, as it were, other Christs, other miniature saviors, part of his body. And this is not merely the vocation of priests and religious, but every, all of us. Remember I said the imitation of Christ is not something which is done externally. It's not just merely reproducing his virtues and characteristics. We imitate Christ in order to mystically continue him throughout time, to prolong the incarnation, the redemption, to prolong his life into ours, to build up and complete the whole mystical Christ who incorporates and includes both Jesus and us. Head and members form one mystical person. So our sufferings, no matter how tiny or obscure, have a profound meaning and value when they're united with his. They actually save souls. They actually repair for sin. And make reparation. And our Lord, as it were, pleads to each of us. He says, give me, will you give me your humanity? I can't suffer anymore, but you can. I need you. I want to continue my passion in you. I want to continue to save souls through you. To suffer, to pray, to work, to glorify and love my Father through you, through your life. One short life is not enough for my love. I need your body for physical sufferings and your soul for spiritual suffering. Put me in place of your will in such a way that I may act by you and in you. When you work, I work by you. When you rest, I rest in you. In a word, you must no longer live to yourself, but let me live in you. Give me your heart. Give me your sufferings. Because sinners need you. I need you. That's what our Lord is saying to us. And one last point, which I must, we all must keep in mind, that during his passion, and particularly in his agony, our Lord saw all of us, all our future free actions, all that we would choose to do for him or against him, all of our sins and neglect, but also all of our acts of virtue, self-denial and prayer and piety and love, And though our Lord has appeared to many of the saints clothed in sorrow and suffering for the sins of the present day, we know that he can no longer suffer now because he's gloriously risen from the dead. But what we do not sufficiently realize is that what we do now 
had a direct effect upon him then. All our acts were present to his heart during his passion, and we can truly afflict him by our sins. Or we can console him and alleviate him in his agony and suffering by the acts of love and reparation that we do right now. Every time we sin, it is as though we were scourging him or crowning him with thorns or nailing his hands and feet. And we mustn't think, well, that was in the past. Our Lord already suffered. It's over with. How can this sin add anything to the past? We must remember that God is not in time, but in eternity. God sees us right now, and he sees Christ on the cross at the exact same time. It's to him present. It's not 2,000 years difference. God sees both in the same moment. The passion is, as it were, still going on. And what part are we playing in it? Are we afflicting Christ Or are we being comforting angels to his agonizing heart? And this is a reality. Our Lord saw us from the garden of Gethsemane. He saw us from the cross. He knew us. He knew that we would one day be in this church, in front of him in the blessed sacrament, thinking about him, hearing these words about his passion. And that is why we must never be tired of telling him how much we love him, because he hears you. He has heard your prayers on the cross and your acts of love, and they've given him much strength and courage and consolation. We can almost use the present tense. He is hearing you. He is seeing you right now. And therefore, let us be comforting angels for the suffering Christ. Compassionate him right now, today, and he will feel it. Help him carry his cross. And if you help him, he will give you a share in his glory. He will say to you one day, I was carrying my cross and you helped me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.